Hello. Hi. How is everybody? Good. Good. I'm happy to see you all here. I think we probably have a few others who are going to straggle in and claim rush hour traffic, but you guys all made it, so we're going to get going. Uh, thanks again for coming. This is Appetite for Life at Johnson & Wales. I'm Suzanne Dane. I'm Director of Community Outreach and Development at the Nutrition Research Institute in Kannapolis. And tonight, you're going to hear from our registered dietitian, Steph Solo. Steph Solo, let me say it straight into the mic. And Chef Megan Lambert. I obviously don't speak into these often enough because I'm doing a really bad job. So they're going to present a lot of great uh, recipes and delicious um, nutritious information, and I'm going to hand it off to them right now. Welcome, everyone. Who's been to one of these events before? I probably saw a lot of familiar patients. So welcome back. Hopefully we don't bore you with the same nutrition info. I believe nothing has changed since I saw you last in the nutrition <laughs> world. But um, that doesn't mean that nutrition is something that we're learning a lot about. So hopefully today we can um, learn something new. And I know that um, October is we're talking about breast cancer awareness and cancer awareness in general. So hopefully we can maybe bust some myths there. And I always like to make it a point that nutrition is a very new science when it comes to the sciences in general. So we are learning something new every day. And you're sort of bombarded every single day with a nutrition headline. You know, this cures this and this causes that. So hopefully we can create some sanity around all of that today. So with that, I'm going to let it turn it over to Megan. She's going to start us off, and we're just going to bounce back and forth and give you some tidbits throughout, okay? Okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome, everybody. Nice to have you here. I'm Megan Lambert. I teach in the culinary program here. I teach um, baking and pastry and nutrition, which is it's a long story. Um, but I do love to help find really easy, quick ways to enjoy delicious food that's still good for you. And it, you know, I think if you listen to the news or sometimes you read um, scientific literature, you might think that that's really a difficult proposition, but I promise it's not. Um, so uh, one of our thoughts uh, with today's presentation was to show you some things you could do with some convenience products. Um, Everybody is short on time. I'm short on time. I'm sure you all are short on time. I'm glad you made the time to be here with us. Um, but anything we can do sometimes to sort of make some shortcuts is good. On the other hand, I think, you know, sort of some of the problems that we've run into in terms of our health in this country is the fact that we're really relying maybe a little too much on processed foods and things that just come right out of the, the freezer onto the table. So there's going to be some cooking involved, um, but we're going to use some products that can maybe help you cut down on time, help you do things a little bit faster, but still use products that are really good for us and that are not going to um, you know, interfere with our nutritional goals. Okay? And maybe find some things that will actually enhance what you're doing already, I hope. So we are going to do, um, the first thing I'm going to get started is uh, lentil soup. So you might not think that cooking beans is uh, much of a time saver, but I would say lentils are one of the quicker cooking beans, and so we're using dried lentils here. Um, and they cook in about 20 minutes, so fairly quick. Um, but there are other things you can do here. You could also... You can, I think you can buy lentils and other beans already cooked and frozen. So that's one way to go. You can buy a frozen product. Um, you can cook them in the pressure cooker, which takes about six minutes instead of 20 minutes. Uh, I don't have a pressure cooker today. We're just going to do it the old-fashioned way. Um, or you could buy canned products. Uh, what are some things we need to watch out for with canned products? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, and I will say, you can also buy lentils sometimes cooked in a vacuum pack in the refrigerated section of a certain grocery store, so depending on where you shop, you might be able to find lentils that way. But, um, but Megan brings up a great point. Lentils are more of a faster cooking dried bean, but you know if you don't even have the time to use that type of bean, cook it on the 
a dried form. We can always use a canned form of bean. Um, other dried beans take much longer to cook, you know, hours, and you know, we soak them for hours, and then we have to cook them, and all these things. So we can use the canned variety, and that's totally fine. Some good things to look for when it comes to canned varieties of beans, or any canned vegetables in general, you want to look for the no salt added kind. And I know sometimes that's hard to find, or maybe your favorite bean doesn't come in that variety. If it doesn't, just give it a good rinse, you know, throw it in a strainer under some cold water and rinse it for a minute. And you really will be able to remove a good chunk of that sodium that's in those canned beans. Like somewhere between like a third to 40% of that sodium can wipe itself out. So make sure you give those beans a good rinse. Yeah. So all I've done is I've got some onion here that I've diced up and I'm sauteing with a little bit of olive oil um, or your fat of choice. You can use whatever kind of oil you like pretty much. Um, and so I'm going to saute my onion. I'm going to add in my garlic and ginger. I've got some Indian spices in this soup. So uh, Indian food is one of my favorite flavor profiles. And it's, it can be fairly easy to get you know, a lot of flavor in a simple preparation. So I've got garlic and ginger that are going to go in next. And then I'm going to um, add in some turmeric. I've got brown dried turmeric and uh, garam masala which is an Indian spice that you can, uh, you should be able to find at the grocery store or at a, an international grocery. Um, and that's going to give it a lot of flavor. So I'm going to add in my spices and saute those for a minute. And then I'm just going to add my lentils. And I've got vegetable broth here. You could use water, you could use vegetable broth, you could use chicken broth, you could use beef broth, whatever you, you like to put in there as your liquid. And again, I think we'd probably want to use a lower sodium broth um, or a homemade. And then once that cooks, we're just going to add some frozen spinach to it. Um, Do you squeeze out all the water and thaw that before you throw it in there? In the spinach? Yeah. Um, I don't know that I necessarily would for this because it's a soup. Uh, we could always just cook the soup down if we wanted it to be thicker. Right? If you want a thicker consistency, just kind of let it cook down faster. Or you can always take out some of your lentils um, after they've been cooked and put them in a blender very carefully and puree the lentils and that can thicken the soup. So that can be a quick way to thicken up your soup um, without cooking it for a long time since we're trying to save some time. Um, one thing we should talk about when it comes to beans, anybody here avoid beans for reasons? Then you might want to not talk about public. <laughs> <laughs> or that we might not want to talk about. <laughs> okay, okay. So beans, yes, the starch in beans can produce gas, and it's well known. There are many jingles we can sing about beans for a good reason. But if you don't eat a lot of beans, beans are super nutritious. They're very nutrient dense. There's a lot of great nutrients in there. Folate and selenium and a good plant-based source of protein. And we're talking about cancer, so folate and selenium have both been associated with reduced risk of cancer, so we want to you know, highlight that there. But when it comes to that gas that beans can produce, a good way to sort of navigate around that is, one, make sure you're, if you're soaking your beans and you're cooking them, make sure you change off that water. And the other thing is don't eat too many at one time. If you're not used to eating beans, I know this might sound like a very obvious tidbit, but take your time, slowly, slowly incorporate beans into your diet, and you know, gradually increase the amount of beans that you're eating. Because if you go full fledged, full on, I'm eating beans, it might not be a pretty sight, but over the course of time, I, I promise your body will adjust to those starches, and you'll be able to digest them more. Nicely. Right, so just adding my liquid here. And Megan brought up a good point about using the low sodium broth if you're going to use it. You can always add salt back in and more than likely you're going to add a little bit more or if not a lot more salt in, if you were to add it yourself versus buying sodium, a full sodium version of the broth. So go for that low sodium variety. You can always add in a little bit of salt if you need to. Yes. Oh, you can answer one. I'll answer it. I'll just repeat it for everyone. Oh, okay. Um, uh, Megan mentioned that you can use any type of oil. Uh, she can use 
olive oil. But I've read that canola oil is like not a usual oil because there's no such thing as a canola plant or something like that. Okay. So the question is um, based on what we should be using as an oil. Megan's using olive oil, and she's heard that canola oil is not really an oil. It is. It's fine. Canola comes from a canola plant, yes? Uh, well, it's, it's it's called rape seed, rape seed, which right. is why nobody wants to say it. Why they changed the name to canola, right. which is Canadian oil. Canadian oil, yes. That's what the name it comes from. from Canada. They grow a lot of uh, rape seed in Canada. But it is a real plant, and they do extract the oil. It is it is a real thing. I don't know. I don't know what other uses we have for that plant in the in the diet. So that might be where we kind of are surprised about using it as a an oil. But we use it for we use it for a long, long time, and it works very well. And it's it's a nice source of monounsaturated fat. So um, I don't have any any problem using it. But again, you know, you can you, you can certainly use any kind of oil that you like in here. Um, peanut oil would work well. That's a good monounsaturated fat. Um, you know, if you want to go coconut, I bet coconut would taste really delicious in this. Um, we, you know, there's all this controversy about saturated fat versus monounsaturated fat. Um, but I think we're finding and we're learning that it's less of a problem what kind of fat you eat, as long as total fat isn't really too high. So, you know, I say, I say, use what you like. Here. Yeah, you're not eating boatloads. You know, I like to tell people everything can be bad in too large of a quantity. So you just have to always take that into consideration. Yes, question. Yes, I'm allergic to soy. So the question is, um, uh, is there a relationship between soy, which is a, a very common allergen, and other beans like kidney beans or lentils and their composition and relationship to allergies? Um, so, you know, anybody can be allergic to anything. Um, soy is a very common allergen. The beans are definitely different in protein structure. They have a different combination of essential and non-essential amino acids. So their profiles are definitely different. Uh, but you may react to both, and that's just sort of how our bodies are. And one really cool thing what the Nutrition Research Institute at the UNC campus is doing is they are studying this personalized nutrition. You know, everybody has their own genetic makeup, and they're all doing different things. You know, one day we might be able to scan our fingerprint or whatever and pop out a, a you know, this is the diet that's going to work for you. I mean, that might be our future. Probably not scan our fingerprint, maybe take our blood, but you know what I'm talking about. Um, but his other comment was that lemon on beans may help with the gaseous effect. But whatever works, I definitely think there's a, a lot of different stories yes. about what works. And um, a lot of people say change the water in the beans um, after you soak them. Um, and other cultures use other products. Like in Mexico, where my husband is from, they use a, an herb called episote. They would not make beans without episote. So, because they say that cuts down on the on the gas. So, you know, I think there's uh, a lot of stories. And and you know, the mind is a powerful thing. So, if you believe it, it works, whether it does or not, right? But it works. So, I, I think. Um, I don't know if it works, but, but it's worth a try. It does work for you. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and start on our little salmon cake. So the, the next dish I'm going to make is a salmon cake that we made with canned salmon. So using a canned salmon, uh, I think you'll, you're probably going to talk about salmon and what a great product it is nutrition-wise. Um, but Canned salmon is also a, a nice product then that we can use to get those great fats. Um, and we use a, uh, it is not a boneless, skinless salmon. Who, who likes to use canned salmon at home already? 
Okay, so uh, do you prefer skinless, boneless, or do you prefer regular? Skinless, boneless. It's a lot easier to work with, right? Um, because believe it or not, if you, if you haven't used canned salmon before, when they can it, they just put the they just put a chunk of salmon in, and so the skin, the bones, and everything. So the first time you open a can of regular canned salmon, you might go, ah, what happened to my salmon? Um, because there is skin and bones in it. We pulled those out. We do not have the skin and bones in the meat. Um, but you can buy skinless boneless, which would make it even a, a quicker product to use if you don't have to pull the skin and bones out. You can eat a certain amount of that um, because, I'm talking too long, my pan's getting too hot. You can eat a, you know, a certain amount of, the, the skin is not bad for you. Um, you might not enjoy it, but it's not bad for you. And a certain amount of the bone in there is going to help to give you some calcium. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a little bit of the bone in there and it sort of dissolves as you cook with it. But just as a kind of an aesthetic thing, I, I tend not to use that one and I like to skin the bone. Like. So here I'm just going to saute a little bit of um, onion and pepper. They're beautifully diced. I'm not sure I could dice them that nicely, but I have a lovely team of helpers back there who help get, get some stuff ready for a demo. And I'm just going to saute this just a touch until it is um, softened and the onion is translucent. And then I'm going to add my garlic to it. And then I'm going to let it cool down for just a minute. Once I put it in the, the bowl and let it cool down, then I'm going to add my salmon. I'm going to add um, all the juice that came with the salmon in there. I'm going to add an egg and a little bit of breadcrumb as a binder. Um, to kind of hold it together. And the breadcrumbs are just breadcrumbs that we've purchased, but you can certainly make them yourself. Um, you could buy whole wheat breadcrumbs or make your own whole wheat breadcrumbs if you're, again, trying to add more fiber and whole grains into your diet. Um, so you could do that. Yeah, so let's talk about that canned seafood. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Um, on your recipe, you said um, salmon or canned fish. Are you talking about tuna fish or some specific kind of fish? Uh, you could use tuna. You could use, um, you know, I don't know if they're doing a canned trout in North Carolina, but if you use a, a local trout, you could use a smoked fish as well for this. It would be delicious. Oh, um, and I've even found a, a smoked canned salmon, which was really, really nice. So a lot of options that you could do in terms of what kind of fish you want to use in the, in the cake. But what's she, so that's going to tell you what's great about the fish. Yeah, so I think we've talked about this many times in the past, but that salmon and other fatty fish like tuna, mackerel, um, anchovies, sardines, all of those fatty fish really have a lot of those essential omega-3 fatty acids in them, and those are the ones that are really heart healthy. We want to eat more of them. Most of us don't eat enough of them. Um, and we can get those omega-3 fatty acids from plant sources too, like walnuts and flax seeds, but it's, it's a very inefficient process to convert it into what we need. So if you can eat more of those fish products, that's a better bet because you're going to get more bang for your buck. Um, and it's, a really, it's really beneficial for your health. With the canned products, you know, I think a lot of us forget about the protein in the middle of the grocery store. You know, we, we think of protein, we think meat, chicken, eggs, cheese, and those are all great sources of the protein. They all come with their own benefits. But some of the more economical protein sources, um, eggs are pretty economical, but as far as um, complete protein sources with all of our essential amino acids, we forget about things like canned salmon, and canned tuna, um, even sardines and anchovies, those fish provide us a good source of protein, those good fats, and if you're eating those small fish in those small bones, and like I get touched on, you could even eat a little bit of those salmon bones if you wanted to, those are going to provide you with some calcium that's really bioavailable and really going to be able to be used by our body pretty well. So you want to opt for those choices. Um, any other protein sources in the center of the grocery aisle that we can think of that might be good to include and a little less costly than maybe some animal products sometimes. Anybody think of any? Beans. Okay, we talked about beans. Yep, that's a great one. Any others? Peanut butter. Peanut butter, yes. Any peanut butter, nut butter. I know they can be expensive when you purchase the whole container, but 
they last for a decent chunk of time. So buying those nut butters can be an investment up front, but they do last for a while and they're pretty easy to use. Same thing goes for nuts. If you're going to buy nuts, try to buy them in you know an area where you can buy a bulk amount of nuts because they usually are less cost costly that way um, versus you know sometimes you can only find them in the baking aisle with in the little packages. But I think they're becoming more available to us in everyday grocery stores. Yes. So they might have all the essential amino acids, but the, the key is that we refer to complete proteins. Her question was, she's heard that sweet potatoes have a complete protein profile. And while they may have all the essential amino acids, they don't have them in necessarily the right amounts to provide us with enough. Now, most of us don't really need to be concerned with combining proteins and eating, um, you know, making sure we eat our rice with beans. You know, we are usually getting enough food, so as long as we're eating enough food and enough protein throughout the course of the day, that's really what matters. Now, pro sweet potatoes don't really have a lot of protein in general. They're more of a carbohydrate food source. But yeah, they do provide a little bit of protein. But if you're only eating plants, you're not eating any animal products, then you want to make sure to include a variety of plant-based sources of protein to make sure that you get in a variety of those um, amino acids that are needed for health. So that means including beans, vegetables, grains, nuts and seeds. Those are all going to provide you with the protein that you need. Yes, so you have a question? Yes. Um, are we limited in the number of servings of fish, specifically salmon, that we can have within the week, I guess? So, no. What I would say is you should try to get in at least a couple servings a week. Most of us aren't doing that. Where we need to be careful is if we are um, pregnant or at risk of becoming pregnant, we want to just be cautious of those higher mercury-containing fish, and those are swordfish, shark, pilefish, and there's another one that's looking my mind, but there's four really big ones um, sure. that you want to, el specifically the albacore tuna, um, not the other tuna, the albacore tuna, that you would want to just limit to two servings a week. We know that the risk um, sorry, we know that the benefit outweighs the risk of those mercury-containing fish, so as long as we're, you know, if we're in that category of people, we just want to limit it to two servings a week, but most of us, we're, we're okay with eating fatty fish in general, but most people aren't eating the cuttlefish or shark or swordfish, so. What kind of tuna would you say is better to have? Well, the albacore tuna tends to have more fatty acids in it, but of the omega-3 fatty acids, but it, you know, with that fat comes those heavy metals. So, but we know that you know the, the risk for mercury is, is low. Mercury poisoning is low. So, you know, we know that the benefits outweigh those risks. Chunk light is a better better choice than albacore. Yes, it, albacore or white tuna is, is more of a predator fish, and the chunk light is kind of yeah. It just the the. Omega-3 content of that is a little less than the albacore, but you're still going to get those benefits, you know, just not as many. Two of these out there in the grocery store. Yeah. I've got my salmon mixture done. I added a little bit of the breadcrumb to just kind of um, thicken it up just a touch. Um, and then we're going to scoop it. Of course, I have a fancy scoop. If you didn't have a fancy scoop, you could uh, just use two spoons, make a little patty, and then we're going to put it into the breadcrumbs and then saute in our pan over here. The so other thing I did want to say about the fish, um, you know, if you are opting for the camera, it, it, it's always going to be much less expensive than opting for the fresh, or even a frozen fish is going to be more expensive than that canned stuff. So, Go ahead and purchase it. You can keep it in the pantry for a while. It's not going to go bad. That way you're always prepared. I always tell people, you know, keep some canned options in the, in the pantry. Keep some frozen options in the freezer so that you are prepared to make helpful choices most of the time. I'm just spreading my little salmon patties. And I'm going to heat up my oil and then just saute. Yes. Yeah, so the albacore tuna is going to have more of those omega-3 fatty acids, but that also comes with more mercury. So that's just one that if we're in a group of people that should be 
cautious of murder, which is mostly pregnant women or people that are going to become pregnant. Um, and the chalk light is just going to have less, but therefore less mercury, oh, less omega-3 fatty acids and therefore less mercury as well. But we still suggest like two to three servings of yes. fish, even yes. for pregnant women. Yes, correct. Like I was saying, the benefits of those omega-3 fatty acids, regardless of where they're coming from, you know, outweigh the risks of mercury. We just want to avoid some of those really, really heavy metal fish, like I said, the, the shark, the swordfish, the tilefish, and the... the I don't think monkfish is on that list, but yeah. there's four big ones that are on the, the list of things of, to avoid when you are pregnant. But other than that, most people aren't doing that. Yes? I think that might be king mackerel. King mackerel, thank you. You win. <laughs> <laughs> now my pan's too low, so I'm waiting for this to heat up a little bit to saute my um, salmon cakes. And okay. then I will move on to the hummus in just a second. Yeah, so, um, yeah. I was just going to ask if you could talk about the temperature she originally started at cooking and what temperature you're, you're cooking at now. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I sauteed on sort of medium high heat and then I probably want to go about like that to, to do my salmon cakes. I just let my pan cool down a little bit too much. So I probably had it a little too hot for my onions and a little too low for my pan. <coughs> Such goes the demo. Um, but yeah, so, you know, medium high thereabouts. But trying not to burn our onion and pepper mixture, and then trying to make sure that we do get a nice little crisp crust on our salmon cake would be good. Anybody you like to use the canned fish? Yeah, okay, good, good. And do we have a group of people that purchases canned versus frozen vegetables? Can talk a little bit about that while Megan's. Any? No? What? Both? Okay. So I, I, we're talking about convenience here. And yes. But isn't canned vegetables a little more saltier than frozen? Mm -hmm. Yes. So you that's are, why I, I use frozen. Yep. So we talked a little bit about the canned beans, and the same thing goes for canned vegetables. You know, when we are using the canned variety, you know, we're going to be adding in that sodium that helps to pre preserve that food. Um, but they do make no salt added varieties of those canned vegetables, so you can always opt for those. When you're buying the frozen ones, those don't come with sodium unless you're buying one that is seasoned or that comes in a sauce or something like that. But most of those are plain. So go ahead, load up the pantry, load up the, the freezer with those frozen and or canned options. So that you're again always prepared, and you can again give those canned vegetables a rinse um, to get rid of some of that sodium if you can't find the no salt added varieties. Okay, and I would just say in terms of like quality, in terms of freshness, um, the the vegetable that is most like fresh is frozen because they're harvested when they're ripe, they're frozen quickly, and they keep them really fresh. Uh, versus, you know, a canned vegetable, which is great if you, you don't have even frozen vegetables, but, um, you know, canned vegetable is better than no vegetable, um, but I think my hierarchy would be fresh, and then frozen, and then canned. I might disagree with Megan. Ah, okay. I would say that it depends on where your produce is coming from. Because True, for sure. As produce travels, it does their nutrients do degrade over time. Yes. And Megan said, you know, fresh or sorry, frozen is processed at the peak of season. So they pick it, they process it really fast. They preserve those nutrients. They plop it, plop it in the freezer, and boom. When you get it, you heat it up. As long as you're not drowning it in water and losing all those water soluble nutrients, then you're going to get a quote unquote fresh product, right? Now canned, they're also, you know, they're also processed at their peak of season, but they're also exposed to more heat. You know, they're they're soft, they're cooked, right? So in some cases they are losing some nutrients. In other cases their nutrient profile is enhanced. For example, things like carrots or tomatoes, they do really well when they're when they're heated because some of their other nutrients or their other phytochemicals, those plant chemicals come out when they're exposed to heat. So it really depends, but for the most part, I would say that it depends on the time of year with the hierarchy, but um, it's always a good idea to have the, those frozen ones are 
always going to have the nutrient profile that you want. They're always going to be quote unquote fresh in a frozen form. Um, and that fresh variety may or may not, depending on where it came from. You know, if it came from down the street and it was picked last week, then yeah, it's gonna be great. But if it traveled from Mexico, you know, last year, then it may not. So you really just have to weigh those things. The amount of nutrients that degrade over time is not that significant. I mean, there's still going to be things there. It's not like you're eating a piece of cardboard. But you just wanna, you know, you can weigh all those options, especially when it comes to cost. And my, uh, my farmer's market privilege was showing. <laughs> yes, yeah, with the vegetables that fresh. Question. Um, do you lose nutrients when you microwave the frozen vegetables oh. as opposed to steaming them? Um, so I, I think there are probably some loss of nutrients regardless of how you cook them. Um, when you steam them, in a you know very small amount of water and it's not like I said drowning in water when you're boiling nutrients a lot of those water soluble nutrients will come out in the water so as long as you're steaming them if you're cooking them at a high heat in the microwave you're, you're not really getting that much loss of, of nutrients so um, I think that the major issue is how much water you're using yeah it's not like boiling the vegetable and then throwing all the water yeah. away right and and some nutrients do break down with heat like vitamin C will break down with heat so if you're cooking a vegetable that has a lot of vitamin C um, in a soup or whatever, you're not going to get as much vitamin C, which is, I think, why it's important to emphasize a variety of um, cooking techniques, eating some foods raw, some foods cooked, because like Steph said, some nutrients, you get better uh, absorption and use of nutrients after the food is cooked. So this I think, a variety of things so that you're covered either way. Uh, it gets very complicated thinking about which nutrients are destroyed with heat and which aren't. Um, but I, I would say just good general rules that are don't throw, don't boil, don't boil vegetables. And to be honest, you know, if you're throw all the water away. If you're eating fruits and vegetables, that's really the most important thing. I mean, really, the amount of nutrients that you could potentially lose is really not going to be that traumatic. I mean, so. Getting in the fruits and vegetables is the most important piece. I wouldn't bang your head against the wall worrying about how many nutrients you might be losing in water. Yeah, especially if you're eating a variety of things yeah. and, and eating them in a variety of ways. So I'm going to go ahead and dress my little salad here. I just got a, a nice pre-washed salad mix. Um, we made a vinaigrette, and you should have the recipe on the website, I believe. I don't know if it's in your package. Yes. This one? You have the salmon cake recipe? Oh, they're all in. They're all in there. Oh, yay. Oh, wonderful. Um, so the vinaigrette, super, super simple. I didn't demo it just because it's so simple. You basically throw everything in a bowl and whisk it. You know, you don't have to be so careful that you emulsify the fat into the mixture. It's really not that big of a deal. Um, the other chefs. Um, but I've got my dressing here. And in fact, if you wanted to make a big batch of it and throw it in the blender, that works really well too. Also cheating, but again, don't tell the chef. Um, and so we're just going to dress the salad here with a little bit of our um, mustard and maple vinaigrette. And then I'm going to plate it up with the salmon cake. So does it, who here makes their own salad dressing? Good. Good. Some of you. Not everyone though. I promise it's easy. And it tastes a lot better than what you get in the, in the bottle. We can make a bunch of salad dressing ahead of time and keep it? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you're going to get at least a, a week shelf life from a salad dressing, probably more because it has a lot of um, acidity in it. You're going to have a nice shelf life from it. Um, so, you know, at least a, a week at a time. You can make your salad dressings and have them ready to go. You just don't want to dress your greens if you're not going to eat them. Yes, because then they're going to get soggy. So we want to make sure that you're dressing right as you serve the, the salad. Um, if you make your dressing, you know, bring it on the side um, so that it doesn't get too soggy. Okay. Okay. What for the mixed greens? What's that? The greens. Yeah. What vegetables did you use for the mix? These are just a mix of lettuces. So I think it's just like a red lettuce, a green lettuce, there may be some mizuna in there. 
Um, but any of the salad greens are great. Even, you know, baby greens like baby <laughs> kale, um, baby char. You can get some really lovely mixes at the, the grocery store um, or farmer's market and then um, just use whatever you would like there. So just a nice, whatever kind of raw green that you like. And those are really easy and super fast to use because they're like triple washed. You don't even have to wash them. I know some people still wash them and whatever, but not do that. You just throw them in a bowl and they're good to go. So super easy. Yes. Um, can is there a big nutrient difference between barn and wild caught fish? Yes, there are some differences. Her question is, are there differences between farmed and wild caught fish? And the answer is yes. So when new, when fish are farmed, um, we have control over their feed, so we can give them more feed that contains, let's say, food that will make the fish have more omega threes in their in their body. Um, wild it really just depends on what's out there, what they're eating. So. You know, when we look at the nutrient profile of a fish, it's based on an average of all the wild fish that we've we've looked at. So, you know, is one better or worse? You know, you really have to weigh your values and where you're getting it. There's really um, nothing I can say there. But as far as the nutrient profile, yes, there is going to be some difference. In some cases, the wild form will have more omega-3s because they are controlling that diet and they're feeding those fish food that will allow them to produce more. Yes. So the question is, um, is tilapia a good or bad fish? I mean, tilapia is great. It doesn't really have a lot of omega-3s in it, um, but it's a great white fish. And Wait, does tilapia have a lot of omega-3s in it? I don't think it's one of the oh, higher ones, but it has, like, also, you know, it's, it's still a fish. And what I would say about the tilapia is, where is it coming from? We have some local producers here that are feeding their fish very good food. Um, and I don't think we have the worry there. I think the worry is when we're, the tilapia is coming from other places where they're farming and there's not necessarily the control over how clean the water is or what they're feeding those fish. Um, so I, I have no trouble eating a local tilapia and there's a couple of good producers in town. Um, uh, I think a lot of the, when people talk about tilapia is bad, it's because it's grown in polluted waters and it's eating who knows what. So I, I would be less likely to buy an imported one, but I would definitely use a local one with no problem. Um, and it's just a, a nice, mild fish, so it's good for a lot of different things. Thank you. What other fish? She wants to diversify her fish options. What other options would you provide to her? Well, we certainly have some really lovely local trout, um, and then other kinds of seafood as well. You know, thinking about shrimp, thinking about. Um, oysters and clams, those can all be part of the seafood recommendation, you know, instead of just fish. Um, and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of fun things out there to, to, to sort of try and play with. Um, you know, I get a little intimidated if I'm buying a local fish that's really expensive. I don't want to mess it up. Um, but fish is, is pretty forgiving. I would say the less you cook it, the better. You just go real light and and mild, and you're just going to have a nice, nice piece of fish. Um, and it goes with so many other things, especially if it's a mild flavor and, and you know, it's very versatile. Um, chef, question: Which type of salmon do you typically use for your recipe? Um, wild caught salmon or hawk? Um, if I if I can get wild caught salmon from the U.S., I would try for that. Um, if I can't get wild caught salmon from the U.S. and I go farm raised. I try to make sure it's a U.S. farm raised. Um, we don't have local salmon here. There's no such thing as North Carolina salmon. I don't think. But, um, but yeah. So if I'm looking for, you know, something from Alaska or um, someplace like that, I'm, I'm looking for 
something that says product of the USA. Um, we do have the point of origin labeling, so you can see what country it comes from. And the, the flags and the American salmon on the can doesn't necessarily mean that it actually is a U.S. race. So you need to look at the, the fine print and the point of origin is what I would say. Yeah. All right, I'm going to start the hummus. So I had this water boiling, so now it's <laughs> now it's the right amount of water for this amount of peas. It's a tiny little amount of peas. Um, you can scale this recipe up or down. You can make hummus for a crowd. Um, this is a really nice recipe that I like. It, has anyone ever had a pea and mint hummus before? A couple people. A couple people. Good. I hope you're courageous and you want to try this one because it's. I really like this one. It's delicious. The mint gives it a nice freshness. Uh, it's very good. So we do want to blanch the peas really quickly. These are frozen peas that came right out of the freezer. Um, and then we can put them in our boiling water, lightly salted. And blanching just means we're going to put them in there and we're going to boil them for a few seconds. And then we're going to go ahead and strain them and then run some cold water over it to stop them from cooking. If we overcook our peas, we're going to have army green hummus. If we, which is not going to look very appetizing. If we cook our peas just right and don't overcook them, then we're going to have beautiful bright green hummus, which is luckily what we have out on the table. Um, so it's just a, a really, um, I, I think this is just a lovely recipe. And so, you know, hummus is great, and I like hummus too, and you get a lot of nice fiber and nutrients from hummus, but I think the, um, the added vitamin A in the peas makes it a nice, a nice option, something a little bit different to do. So, we talked a little bit about frozen vegetables already. Yeah, I was just going to add another tidbit about the beans and some of the nutrients that come in beans. So iron is one of those nutrients that you know, it's commonly found in animal products, specifically meat and, and chicken and, and things like that. Um, but when we're not eating meat, if we're opting for a more, you know, plant sources of protein diet, you know, it's important to still get in your iron. And, you know, you're going to get a little bit of iron from beans and grains and leafy greens and things like that. But that iron is, is less available to our body, so we want to try to enhance that a little bit. So a good way to do that is to make sure you're eating your plant iron with a source of vitamin C. So vitamin C is going to help enhance that. So either combining it with tomato or a citrus fruit, depending on what you're eating, you will be able to increase that absorption of that, that iron. Otherwise, it's, it's not going to be very available to your body. Yes? Uh, do beans, the question is, do beans have an effect on your blood sugar? The answer is yes. So beans are starchy vegetables. So when we're talking about managing blood sugar for anyone that does have an, you know, a blood sugar that's too high, then we're always gonna put the beans in the carbohydrate category. So carbohydrate foods, in the case of managing blood sugar, include starchy vegetables. So that's any bean, like a, a kidney bean, a lima bean, a butter bean, any potato, pea, corn, those are all starchy vegetables. Fruits, sweets, milk and yogurt, and, and grains. Those are all of our carbohydrate foods. Those are the foods that impact our blood sugar the most. And I know that I put some vegetables in there. It doesn't mean they're bad. It just means that those foods make our blood sugar go up the most quickly. So we just want to be cautious if we do have blood sugar problems, that we want to keep those carbohydrate foods appropriately controlled at, at each of our meals. But what could be the benefit of beans versus other carbohydrate foods. So beans versus other carbohydrate foods, uh, and also your other starchy vegetables and whole grains that are going to have more fiber, um, and they're going to, you know, provide you with those extra nutrients, you know, like, you know, refined grains and are going to not have that fiber, and that fiber is important because it's needed for a lot of different things. It creates bulk in our diet, it helps to keep us regular. And we want to make sure to include enough of those starchy vegetables. We just want to make sure that we don't eat too much of them at one time if we're talking a little about blood sugar. But if we combine those carbohydrate foods with protein, if we're eating them together, that protein acts as a way to sort of slow down the impact of um, that simple molecule of glucose, which is what that bean essentially turns into. Um, 
part of it and helps to slow down the release of that glucose into our, our bloodstream. We have another question, yes? So I would disagree with you a little bit, okay? I don't think all the carbohydrates are bad. Bad carbohydrates are bad for, for diabetes, okay? But beans are not bad for diabetes. No. Fruits are not bad for diabetes. No, no. Okay, because they, they contain the fiber. Correct. They contain, beans are very high in resistant starch, mm -hmm. which isn't absorbed by the body. So you don't eat on the calories, which you'll see on the package. But you also don't get the rapid influx of glucose in the bloodstream because of the fiber, because of that resistant starch, okay? And same thing with fruits. You know, I always tell people, eat the orange, not the juice. You know, because the fiber and mother put, the package that Mother Nature puts it in, slows that release of glucose in the blood. So you don't get the insulin spike like you do with refined sugar products. Correct. So, so the... I think sometimes we, we misinform people and we tell them that fruits are... are Diabetic shouldn't eat food. No, no, and that's not what I'm saying. So the, 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 the clarification is that, you know, there that I was saying that beans and other foods are bad for blood sugar. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying we want to make sure that we're not eating too much of them at one time. Because those foods, no matter what they do, what their composition is, they are going to break down into glucose and they will impact your blood sugar. The rate at which it impacts your blood sugar is going to be different based on the whole composition of that food but it still will impact your blood sugar. So I'm not saying that you shouldn't eat fruit, you shouldn't eat starchy vegetables. I'm just saying if you have an insulin sensitivity problem or if you have a blood sugar that might be too high, if you have diabetes, those are foods we just want to be cautious of eating too much of at one time. Yeah. Still, still probably need to count the carbohydrates and yes. think about how much total carbohydrate we're eating for a people diabetic. With, people with diabetics, which creates the diabetes, which is insulin resistance, Type 2 diabetes is the fat in the diet, not necessarily the, the uh, sugars from fruits and beans and all that. Car good carbohydrates, you know, whole, whole carbohydrates. Yeah. It's the fats in it, because it's the fats that block the insulin receptors that doesn't allow the insulin to do its job. Okay? So, fat in the diet is more important than the sugar from, the car from good carbohydrates. I think now, there's. Refined sugar. Yeah, absolutely. And that's sort of what I was getting at when I said benefit of, of beans and legumes over other kinds of carbohydrates because they have that fiber with them and some protein. And if we're making hummus, we're putting a little bit of fat in it, but all of that is going to slow down the absorption rate. And so that's going to keep your blood sugar from going up as high as quick. Right. But I think if someone is actively diabetic, they're still going to need to think about the amount of carbohydrates that they're eating at one time. I would think so. I think for sure over time, you know, fat is going to cause that insulin sensitivity, but if they've got it, they may need to think about carbohydrates in the short term and just in terms of total amount. But certainly this is going to be a whole lot better than sugar, right, or white flour or something that doesn't have that additional fiber and protein and a little bit of fat with it. I'm going to blend, yes, so I'm going to make a lot of noise. And always when I do this, I never have enough stuff because they gave me a little tiny recipe of hummus, and it's probably not going to blend smooth. But through the magic of television, I have some hummus already made. But essentially, <laughs> you throw everything in the blender, and you blend it. It's a weird blender, so I'm just going to throw the peas against the outside of the container, and then we're going to pretend it's blending. Uh, and I hope you're going to make more than a half a cup of peas at a time. So make a, a nice amount of hummus to serve your guests. Uh, and then we're going to serve it here. We have some lovely bright green fresh pea and mint hummus. And we have some um, whole wheat pita chips that we made. So, I mean, you can, you can buy pita chips. Um, but I like to get the whole wheat pitas from the grocery store cut them. So we cut them into eight wedges and then pull the two parts uh, apart. So from one pita, little six inch pita, you should get 16 little wedges. Um, which is probably more than we need at one time, but uh, we're just going to serve our, our hummus with our little pita. And hummus is also a great dip for I think all sorts of vegetables yeah. um, and other things. Um, if anyone has small children, 
Kids love to dip. It's a great way to get them to eat their vegetables um, it's by exposing them to more and more vegetables and things like that. Get them involved and get them to quote unquote play with their food in a way by you know allowing them to dip and things like that. Yes. Is the hummus that she made with the peas? Is it better to use the peas than the chickpeas that they usually make hummus with? Uh, you could pretty much do the same recipe. I don't know that I would typically put mint in with the chickpea hummus. But, you know, it's basically just a regular hummus recipe. Olive oil, garlic, lemon juice, and salt and pepper. And then if you want other spices in the chickpea hummus, you could do that. You could do a little cumin, or you could add some roasted red pepper, or a different color and flavor. Um, and I agree, I love to dip uh, veggies in hummus much more than uh, pita chips. But I went with pita today. I have a question about the hummus. Um, I don't know why, but I thought hummus could only be made from garbanzo beans. <laughs> and then I had lima beans <coughs> on this recently. Yeah. It's delicious. So are there, I know you could possibly do any beans, but are there some beans that you probably wouldn't want to use mm -hmm. for hummus? I don't know that there's anything I would say don't use. I've seen black bean hummus, I've seen white bean hummus. Now people who are from where hummus is from originally might disagree. <laughs> they might say you can only use chickpeas and hummus, but I mean you can make bean dip with pretty much any kind of bean, right? We just call it hummus because it's got garlic and lemon. It sounds better than bean dip, maybe. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, just about any kind of bean is great. White bean is very nice. Um, black bean goes like some southwest flavors in there. Uh, you can change that flavor profile just by adding different spices to it, which makes it really, really delicious and really versatile. All right, what else do I have to make? I'm sure I have something else to go My soup is just about done over here, so I can serve that. I've got a little uh, yogurt raita to go on there, which is super simple. So, she's going to tell us right now. So this might look very similar to tzatziki, if someone is used to eating Greek food, and they call it reita if we're eating Indian food. So because I use Indian spices, I'm calling it reita. Um, and it's basically just a yogurt with um, shredded or grated vegetables, and there's a lot of different kind of reitas that you can make. I've seen them with spinach, I've seen them with carrots, cucumbers, you could do a mixture. I just kept it simple with the cucumbers today. So we basically just shredded up a cucumber on the box grater, also done ahead of time. Um, and you could peel it if you want to. Again, if we leave the skin on, we're getting more fiber. So I like to leave the skin on. Uh, so I've got my cucumber shredded in there. And I've got a little bit of garam masala, again, that Indian spice mixture, which has like cinnamon and cloves and cumin and cardamom and all sorts of lovely spices in there. And then I'm just going to add my yogurt. And this is a Greek yogurt here that we're using to make it a little bit thicker. Um, and then we just need to stir it up, give it a little salt and pepper. And that's just going to be a little bit of garnish on our soup. What else might someone use this for? <laughs> for veggies, it'd be great for any dip as well. Um, we use it as just as a side in a lot of Indian dishes. Um, but you could do it as a, you know, on a sandwich, a wrap, or a pita. Um, more of like the, the Greek or Mediterranean idea. Um, really, the only nutrients that we're getting. I mean, there's not. A, a ton of nutrients and cucumbers are mostly water, but like Megan said, there's fiber if you keep on that skin, and then we're getting a whole lot of calcium and phosphorus and protein and things from that yogurt. So, yes. I just want to ask about that garam masala. Uh, the chef mentioned that you would find it possibly in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. Would you look by the regular spices or would it be an ethnic section of the grocery store? Might be in either place. I think if it you know, in the ethnic section, I don't always see the ethnic spices so much. <laughs> <laughs> I 
this was missing from the ethnic section. Um, but it was, I do see garam masala in the little container. I will say, though, that if you go to the international store, you will get a big bag of spices for a little money. And if you go to the regular grocery store, you'll get a little bottle of spices for a lot of money. So go to the G-Mart. Uh, go to uh, uh, an uh, international grocery. And there's all kinds of fun stuff that you can find in there. Um, you know, uh, so it just, to me, is a little bit better deal on the spices, which also are not local. So we're not going to get locally grown cinnamon. I guess the issue would be trying to use all those spices. Yeah. They probably they probably would freeze well if you had room for them. But you know, if you're cooking food, again, one of the, the ways that I like to make food really flavorful is by using spices. So um, we go through a lot of spices at our house. So I'm just gonna do a little salt of garlic on there. And then that'll mix in as you taste. Lovely. You know, these these types of recipes that Megan's making, um, specifically the soup and the hummus, you know, you can make a, a decent chunk of that and put it in the freezer so that you have some for later. You know, if you can make it, put it in a, a zip top bag and lay it flat after it's cool, of course, and throw it in the freezer and use it that way, or even freeze it in individual freezer containers so that you can pull them out as you need them. Well, these are really simple things that you can make ahead of time to help you be prepared later on when you have a really, really busy week or there's a lot going on. You know, think about those types of things. You know, you don't have to spend four hours every weekend prepping food for the week, which is how a lot of people think we have to eat or what we have to do to be eating healthfully most of the time. But really, if you just think about the things that you're already doing, you know, how can you make that go a little bit farther? You know, making a little bit more soup to put the extra in the freezer to save it for a day when you might be really, really busy. I think the last thing is our yogurt parfait. And I didn't think I needed to demo that. Super simple. Um, <laughs> but I've got yogurt here. And this one's a Greek yogurt. That's, um, I don't know that that would necessarily be my first choice. I'm, I'm a fan of the plain yogurt if I'm just eating it as yogurt. Um, I do do this a lot though. This is something that I bring in my lunch all the time. Rather than buying a carton of yogurt with the, the very sugary, almost fruit on the bottom, I'll get yogurt and fruit and like put a whole serving of fruit in there. Um, and then maybe just a tiny bit of honey or a tiny bit of jam to sweeten it. Just a, just a little bit. But again, it's still not going to be as much sugar as is in one of the cartons of yogurt that you get. Um, and so I'll use frozen berries right out of the bag, put my yogurt in the container, put my frozen berries in the container. The frozen berries keep the yogurt cold. The yogurt makes the berries thaw by the time you get to it, and it all works really well. Uh, and then we're just going to serve with a little bit of granola on top, uh, just for a little crunch. And of course, we wait until we serve that to put the granola on so it's not soggy. Frozen berries are a great idea. Um, it's, I don't know about anybody else, but I buy berries for like two months of the year and then I'm done. Um, just because they don't really taste that great. So opting for the frozen variety is, is always a good one. You can't really eat the frozen variety in, a, in the way, same way you would always eat the fresh variety. But in this way, um, or in, you know, mixed in a, um, an oatmeal or as part of a smoothie. You know, those are always really great ways to use the frozen varieties of fruit. Um, and the same thing goes, you can also use the canned fruit. I would just caution you to look for canned fruit that's in 100% juice or canned in, sometimes you can find it canned in water depending on what you're looking for, but you don't want really, you don't really need it to be extra sweet in the syrup. So just look at the label, it will say right on there, canned in juice and you want that one instead. Again, those are things that you can pick up. They're not very expensive. You can keep them in the pantry, and that way you always have some fruit available, and there's no excuse to not eat fruit. Question? Yes? What's your shelf life on the spices? Shelf life on the spices? I would say, 
you know, yet less than a year. If you've got had some of them hanging around longer than a year, I don't know that it's going to have the the best flavor anymore. Um, I don't think I would say that spices necessarily go bad, but the flavor is really going to diminish over time. Um, and so the key is, you know, does it taste as good as as you want it to taste? If it's not tasting that good anymore, then we can throw it out and get it get new, fresher spices. Um, also can be nice if you have a spice grinder and you want to buy whole spices to just grind them fresh. They will keep longer in a whole form than they will uh, already ground. So you could, you know, if you had whole cumin, then you can grind it as you use it. Then you could even toast it a little as a whole seed. That would bring out the flavor really nicely. And then grind it up as you use it. So some, some thoughts there on spices. Um, but I don't know that spices necessarily go bad, but they just don't, they just don't go good. <laughs> you get a little less good as time goes on. Fresh spices are will go bad, but you can, you know, sometimes you buy, you know, a whole bunch of cilantro and you use not even half of it. So you can always chop some of that up and um, you can freeze it in like an ice cube tray with either a little bit of olive oil and or a little bit of water. I mean, you can't use that in the same way that you would use the actual fresh stuff that you're chopping fresh, but you can still use it to create flavor things, and that way you're not throwing all those fresh spices away. Yeah, and you can just throw it in your soups and things like that. Um, I, I'll even, this may be a little on the weird side, but if I get garlic and ginger and I have, you know, I want to get a lot of them, I'll puree those up together, put it in ice cream trays, and then whenever I make Indian food or Asian food, I just take some of my cubes and throw that in. It's really easy, so I don't have to chop the garlic and ginger every time. I just throw in a couple of cubes. Yes, and, and freeze those. Yeah, keep those in the freezer for forever. Once you freeze them in the ice cream trays, you can pop them out, throw them in like a zip top bag, and then put them back in the freezer so that you're not taking up loads of space with ice cube trays everywhere. So just freeze them, then take them out of the ice cube trays, throw them in a zip top bag. And you're
and the tables are spread out, and I want to urge everybody to spread around and don't get in a big line and follow everybody else. So if you're hungry, skip the line and move to the next table, and then come back to the table you missed, because there'll be plenty there. So please enjoy, and thank you for coming.